The micro EV market continues to explode in a great way. We are all seeing what could be the evolution of something very unique when it comes to the electric vehicle market. My name is Paul Barron. This is Tech Path. We're going to dive into it today with the CEO of Arkimoto, Mark Fronmeyer. Great to have you on the show, man. Hey, Paul. Really great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, looks like you're ready to rock and roll there with your Akimoto, uh hoodie. I need one of those. <laughs> we, we, we've uh, we've got them in the merch store, so we'd be oh, happy to you hook go. you up. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Fine electrical vehicle. I like that. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. This is sort of our, our 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 hipster version of the branding. So very very cool. Very cool. Well, you know, if you if you know what Arkimoto is, uh, you kind of get that vibe when you when you see one of these in real life. Um, let's go into the product itself, kind of the vehicle, how Arkimoto got started for some of our viewers and listeners that may, maybe do not know. Yeah, so, so I actually, I started Arkimoto in 2007, and I, I was not originally looking to start an electric vehicle company. I went looking for, actually went looking for a product to buy uh, and couldn't find it. And what, what I, I, I was actually surprised that the market in 2007 did not have an affordable, high quality, everyday electric vehicle. Uh, and, it, and it was, I, you know, I wasn't looking for a full size car because yeah. there is a, there is, 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 as you know, a giant disconnect between cars and what we actually use cars for every day. You know, we're right. driving four to six empty seats around with us almost everywhere we go. And so, so uh, I wanted something that was, had a, had a right sized footprint for the types of trips I take on a daily basis. Uh, and that really was the that it was that search that was the the impetus to ultimately start Arkimoto. Um And I actually saw a three wheeled kit vehicle in a parade, and it was this that was the the inspiration kind of light bulb moment. And what mm -hmm. what the light bulb really illuminated for me was this the giant gap between the bike and the car. And it's sort of mm -hmm. like you know why is there not uh, a a really winning product in that gap that's you know, much closer to the bike in terms of efficiency, size, footprint, fun factor, but much closer to the car in terms of the kind of capabilities that you need for daily trips. And that started about a seven year iteration process just to get to the right idea. So we built, you know, sort of seven, seven wrong answers before getting to the right one. Uh, and then from there, it was really a, a, a push to go from the kind of napkin sketch looks like works like prototypes to an actual production venture. Uh, and that was, you know, ultimately why we went public in 2017. And then we kicked off production proper uh, in September of 2019. Very cool. Um, I love the evolution of it because in many people I know you are, um, a, I think you were a game engineer at, at one time in your history, is that, yeah. is, if I read that right. So being able to iterate is a, uh, is a very needed thing in today's EV market, especially with just all the new technology. We talk about it so much here on the show that there's just so much rapid change occurring. You have to be very nimble and you have to be able to adapt uh, pretty quickly. I wanna talk to you quickly on your, um, the technology behind the Arkimoto itself. Let's talk a little bit about the battery chemistry that you guys currently use in the, in the, uh, in the EV. And then also, uh, is there any plan for jumping up to any type of autonomous uh, product inside the Arkimoto itself? Absolutely. So, so the, uh, in terms of the battery, I mean, we're using a pretty standard uh, uh, nickel manganese cobalt chemistry today. Uh, I would say ultimately Arkimoto is uh, chemistry and cell format agnostic. Uh, the, the, real, the, the real technology of the company is the platform architecture that right. shaves off you know, two thirds of the weight, um, right. yep. about three quarters of the battery in order to solve everyday trips in the most efficient way possible. Um, and when, 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 when you think about the transition to autonomous vehicles, uh, the, we believe that, it, you know, you, you look at rideshare, uh, mm -hmm. Uber, Lyft, uh, taxis, about 85% of those trips are just one passenger. And yeah, so sure. the idea that the, uh, the, the robo taxi world of the future is going to be, you know, seven passenger SUVs to us doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, which is why we've, we've really aimed the platform that we're building at that autonomous future. So mm -hmm. our, our role is th that we see is the kind of the 
the platform layer of the stack. And then there are a bunch of really smart people working on sensors and software, basically the brains that drive it. We're just saying we've got the right platform for the vast majority of those self-driven trips. And it's when you, when you start to stack up autonomy plus ultralight small footprint platforms plus electric drive plus apps that let you summon vehicles uh, from the touch of a button, you get the multipliers that actually will get us to a sustainable transportation system. So, so autonomy is in the game. Uh, currently on the, on the unit, is there any kind of set of arrays in terms of uh, which most, most EVs now are starting to use or have used uh, going the direction, I should say, of the cameras versus LIDAR? Have you guys already kind of set your platform up to start deal, dealing with these sensors as, as the technology starts to apply to something like what you're making? Yeah, what we're what we're building on the platform right now is really the kind of the master vehicle controller, which takes the drive command, steering command, uh, braking command from that higher level processing stack. So I, I would say that we are we're we're, we're sort of sensor agnostic. Uh, there are some very awesome solutions coming out that are mixes of you know radar, lidar, camera. Uh, yeah. infrared and so on. And so, you know, I, I think that for different applications, so if, as, as an example, we want to use our own platforms as sort of our assembly line um, carriers in the factory. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. a different type of autonomy problem than the generalized, you know, drive at high speed on the highway problem. And so we want to be able to support both models um, you know, really a plurality of models depending on, on the need, a particular market need. So, okay, so, I, I, well, I love the fact that you guys are going, you know, uh, complete, uh, you know, transparency. I, I do invest in Arkimoto. Uh, they're one of many EV right. groups, uh, one of many EV groups that, uh, that I really think are on the right track. Um, what I look at, though, when, uh, especially with your vehicle, the fact that you guys have a roll cage, you've kind of um, implemented somewhat of a design theme that, if I'm correct, you don't require a motorcycle license to operate it. Um, that's right? Well, it, it is. So, so all three wheelers are technically motorcycles, but almost every state now has some kind of a carve out for three wheeled motorcycles okay. that let, let you drive them with just a normal driver's license. Uh, gotcha. Whether those particular provisions apply to the vehicle that we've built depends on a state by state level how that was written. And so, uh, you know, it, and a lot of that work was done by a company called Elio Motors about 10 years mm -hmm. ago. So we're, mm -hmm. we're basically going through all of our early adopter states and making sure that they're, uh, you know, so, sort of the, the public sector powers that be understand the advantages of the Arkhamoto platform, right. Right. Uh, you know, how it fits in with broader climate goals and that it's, it's a super easy thing to drive and shouldn't require uh, a, a special endorsement in order to be able to operate it. Yeah, for sure. The so roll cage so really- found that persuasive. Yeah, and I think with the, the safety mechanisms you have in place, especially with the roll cage, not having to wear a helmet, I guess, depending on the state, but also the capacity of just that kind of that enclosure that helps people feel much more protected in a device that's somewhat open air. Uh, now, as I understand it, you also have the option to be able to put doors on these units. Is that correct? Yeah. So, so I've I've always looked at it like kind of like the Jeep, where you know, so it's an electric motorcycle meets Jeep for getting groceries. Mm -hmm. If the if the weather's good, you you know take the doors off, you ride it open. It's just a it's a really compelling experience to be in the world. Um, and then we have half doors that are just about ready to ship out, uh, and we've got you know, sort of full side enclosure on the roadmap um, yeah. that would be for areas that are, you know, really require, uh, right. you know, if, you, if you've got really nasty weather, you're going to want to be buttoned up. Um, yeah. But, but you know, in a lot of the, the calculus behind this was just, we wanted to get a really compelling base model product into the market um, and, 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 and start working up the scale ramp uh, without adding a ton of additional complexity. And, and believe it or not, doors are actually really tough. Um, yeah. If you think about uh, you know, the, the Falcon wing doors uh, that, that Tesla did for the Model X, that set them back, I think, around 18 months just mm -hmm. on those doors. Um, and so the, the, the easiest way to solve that particular problem is 
to, to start without them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So, okay. So design wise, you've got a, a great framework here. Um, you guys are moving along. I got a chance to sit through your Q3 earnings call and kind of just the overall uh, situation that you guys were currently in. Talk to me about how you're addressing the potential of scalability. I saw really when you look at your third quarter numbers, um, I think it was, if I'm correct, it was about 35 or, or so vehicles that were produced in that quarter. How do you guys look to be able to scale to this number? I think it was 50,000 annual production. What is the roadmap to be able to get you there? So it's, it, we are planning on a major step change that's gonna come you know, basically late next year. Uh, okay. That we, we have uh, entered into an agreement to purchase a new factory space uh, that's going to basically more than 5x our, our production footprint. Uh, right. we, are, we have teamed up with uh, so, some true uh, legends in the field in terms of uh, automotive talent to help right. bring product to scale. Sure. And that's you know, primarily Sandy Monroe and yeah. his team at Monroe Associates. Uh, and that, that's just, uh, you, you've got to have the right team to get the right supply chain in place, mm -hmm. to get the right assembly line in place. Uh, and that's really what we're, that is the bulk of our, our focus right now is, is figuring out, and it, it really is, it's a matter of going over every single piece of the vehicle and saying, you know, how, how are we going to build this particular part of the vehicle at much higher volume? Because right. the techniques and materials that we're using at low volume on kind of that market entry path of, of capital efficiency, those won't all transfer over as we go up to 50k plus units per year, yeah. Um, yeah. and so that's really where uh, it's it's just it's an exhaustive analysis of the product, uh, continued simplification and light weighting, a lot of work on the supply chain, uh, and then making sure that we've got the right team in place to scale. Yeah, with Sandy, um, I had a chance to listen to one of his interviews uh, around three wheel uh, EVs in general, and. Uh, obviously, he was referencing Arkimoto at some points in the interview, but uh, he kind of really talked to this whole price point idea is getting to that perfect price point, which is going to be, um, you know, a mix, obviously, of design, engineering and manufacturing scalability. How far before we could see the Arkimoto unit maybe under $15,000 or is that something that you guys are really trying to get to? We've, we've set an aspirational price target for 2024 of a base model at 11,900. And we think that when it's there, that probably the average selling price will be around 15,000. Okay. Um, and then, you know, we're also, uh, we're, we're the beneficiaries of uh, tax credit support in Oregon and California. Sure. There's a bill yep. uh, in the, in, at the federal level to, to extend a tax credit to three wheeled electric vehicles. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so we, you know, ultimately for, for us, uh, affordability is, is just it's core to the mission. We don't think that we're going to get to a sustainable transportation system until the mass market can afford the solutions. Right. Uh, and so that's why, you know, we we have we have always been shooting for this kind of uh, 10k ish base mm -hmm. model price of a vehicle that serves your everyday needs. And we know that we won't get there for for a number of years. But that's that's where we are headed. And it's not, it, it, it's not so much. Um, I mean, there, there is there is a very healthy niche market uh, at the price point that we're at, we believe. Um, but in, in order to really deliver on and, and make a make a real dent in the emissions problem, we got to build a lot of vehicles and we got to sell a yeah. lot of vehicles. Yeah, for sure. Well, I, I, you know, with Monroe, guy, you know, kind of helping you guys, I think that's going to be a huge step in, in that whole point, because he is definitely in that direction of how do we reduce costs, you know, getting to that uh, engineering, you know, capability that's really going to kind of move us to the next level. You mentioned when you look at uh, selling and, and marketing the vehicles, you guys have a direct sales model, much like a Tesla uh, program. Um, are you running into the same scenarios or are you even in the same situation uh, as what Tesla is with car dealers? Because many states, you can't sell direct. Are, are you guys kind of wide open there? How does that work for you? The, what, what, the, so there are some similarities and some differences. Uh, what 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 is similar is that we have a direct to consumer model. So you put in an order on the website, yeah. vehicle shows up in your driveway. 
the the difference one of the main differences is really driven by the size of the vehicle so because the Arkimoto is so much smaller than a full-size car mm -hmm. you can actually ship them using sort of traditional logistics solutions box mm -hmm. trucks um, yeah. and that lets we 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 have formed a, a collaboration with DHL to actually deliver uh, so that customers can arrange delivery of their vehicles from our factory into their driveways. Um, and that, that me what that means is that in states where we don't actually have any kind of a retail presence, uh, it's, it is customers are actually buying them from us in Oregon. Uh, and, and that is, um, I, I, I guess it's, it's a way of just sort of sidestepping uh, the, the, the sort of monopolistic protectionist laws that are the, the dealer franchising laws in some states. Right. Right. Um, but we, we have the, a, a very similar problem uh, to Tesla and basically every new electric vehicle manufacturer, which is once you get it into market, how do you take care of it? And how do you make mm -hmm. sure that your customers have uh, you know, uh, high quality service uh, on, on, a, on, a, on a timely basis? Right. And so I, I think that's while, while the, the delivery portion is a big chunk that now uh, we were able to offload to a, to a, a good partner, um, making sure that we've got good service in every market that we go into uh, is, is really critical for the growth of the business. So as with scaling the production side, scaling the, the, the care and feeding after the fact is going to be a big part of the next couple of years. Is that a strategy that you guys are working with? Um I mean, because EV, obviously, it's a completely different kind of design setup. You know, you, you're, even the thought architecture is different. So going to a traditional motorcycle shop as a service center, I, I don't, maybe there are, of course, I, you know, obviously there are some electric uh, motorcycles out. I've, you know, had a chance to ride in the new Harley. Um, but is that a potential track for you uh, for service centers? Or are you thinking more in the track of maybe partnering with, you know, existing vehicle manufacturers, maybe other EV manufacturers for service centers, or, or is these going to be just, you know, independent Arcimoto? I, I think there's going to be a mix. So okay. we will certainly have our own service centers in key markets. We'll have mobile service uh, as part of our own service network. Right. And then a lot of the wear items on, uh, on, a, on an electric vehicle your, your typical wear items are things like you know, tires and brakes and shocks and yeah. so on that can be serviced by anyone who can do light automotive service. Yeah. Um, what it, so once we are in sort of a, a, a steady state of production and all of the you know, early wrinkles are, are, are smoothed out of the process and smoothed out mm -hmm. of the vehicle, uh, that, w that, that should comprise a big chunk of our service needs. In the early part of the, you know, sort of the new manufacturer story, there's just a lot of care that, that goes into every vehicle. And so that, that requires more specialized training. Um, and yeah. so, so building out our, our training capability, building out our, our, our service management team is, is really a, a, a big piece of the puzzle for us. Interesting. Um, I'm going to take a trip down to Key West. It's not very far from our uh, studios here and have a chance to hopefully get into one of your units because I've never been in one. And I know you guys have a, a rental facility down there. Uh, when you look at rent and gig work and kind of the, the use case scenario, if that, it, it, as, as a market, do you feel like when you look at the channels, I, I guess really is the question, the channels of where you could sell these, uh, let's call them enthusiasts or, or people that do need, you know, maybe they're, they don't need the extra car, it's the second vehicle, um, or gig and or rental, um, if you looked at those kinds of markets and then compared that to what I think is the, the massive market, which is the delivery and logistics fleets. Um, are you yep. guys trying to match it all up or where is there a specific area that you're really focusing on? Well, well there is, there is uh, the Arkimoto platform is, a, is sort of a multiple shots on goal strategy. Uh, so we've, and, and it really has to do with the fact that the product is, the, the, the multiple products on the platform are largely yeah. the same. The yeah. deliverator and the fun utility vehicle uh, are, are really only differentiated at the very end of the production process. So we, as, as we look to get to true economies of scale, you know, build, being able to build at a rate of 50,000 vehicles a year, in right. order to fill that pipeline, we're envisioning you know, a portion of that is going to be 
vehicle rentals and peer to peer uh, or, or you know ride share type vehicles. Sure. A portion will be consumer vehicles. A portion will be fleet vehicles, um, and that will all add up to a much larger opportunity because every mm. <clears throat> you know the battery is the same, the wheels are the same, the tires are the same, the windshield's the same. Uh, so, so we get that economy of scale in in the parts that we purchase and in our manufacturing process, um, but we go after a, a bunch of different slices. I, I would tend to agree with you that the deliverator is. Uh, I, I think the consensus internally is that the deliverator is um, sort of the the big market opportunity the mass market, for the sure. platform, particularly as we've seen you know last mile delivery kind of go to the moon. Um, yeah. And, and there, there's some real benefits to the Arkimoto platform in terms of cost of operation, uh, speed of getting across town, ability to find parking, uh, and then a lot of storage on that platform. Mm -hmm. We did a model on that issue in our last video, really analyzing Arkimoto, and part of it was developing a fleet or at least having the ability to scale to, to manage a fleet just, just for the purpose of restaurant delivery because of the uh, number of occasions, the number of, of uh, touch points, the number of consumer occasions uh, that are out there. These were pretty massive numbers, even with a very low percentage of um, adopt, adoption in the restaurant industry. If that is a market that could blow up, because this is something that, that we've looked at so much, uh, we have another network over uh, here within our group that focuses on food and the restaurant industry a lot. And delivery and last mile has been kind of the number one pain point that that industry is facing. If there yep. was a solution that came out that it, whether it has autonomy or even if it just had the ability to reduce cost and create some type, some site type of logistics platform, this could be a absolutely groundbreaking uh, evolution. Do you guys see it that way in terms of where your potential opportunity is there at Arkimoto? One hundred percent. Okay. And we, you know, so we've had for. Uh, for, for several months now, we've had a couple of delivery vehicles in the hire car fleet. And the response that we are getting back from delivery drivers with hire right. car has been fantastic. You yeah, know, they, yeah. it's, it's basically confirmed, uh, you know, we believe is confirmed our, our basic ideas about the platform in terms of, you know, what, what's the problem with, with food delivery? It's, it costs too much and it takes too long. Food yeah. sh shows up cold. Uh, and the, you know, the, the, the driver doesn't get uh, enough of the split and the restaurant doesn't get enough of the split. And a lot of that's driven off of, uh, you know, that you're, you're driving a, a gas car around that costs too much and takes too long to make, make the uh, delivery happen. So those are the pain points that, that the deliverator really is focused on solving. Yeah, I like that. Uh, well, and you're right. The, the, the issue right now, when you look at companies like Postmates or Uber, or Uber Eats, um, you're exactly right. The cost of the system and the infrastructure, the logistics platform, and obviously the driver and the vehicle itself that has to go out and do this is, is uh, pretty much putting them in a position that they're almost pricing themselves out of the marketplace. It's just a matter of time before that's going to be eventually taken over by the independent restaurants that figure out their own model. And that's where I think, you know, whether it's a three wheel or some other micro EV that can enter into that space, create kind of a component of a platform uh, in the sense of how operators, and when I say operators, business operators, being able to interface with that platform, whether it's a, an Uber-like you know, network or maybe even an owned fleet. Uh, where the manufacturer actually owns it, which you know Tesla's kind of alluded to this uh, with RoboTaxi yep. of slowly building a fleet of, of these to kind of take over. When you look at that, because that could still be four or five, maybe eight years out before we see that kind of, of uh, innovation really taking off. There's gonna be a lot of growth period in between and a lot of testing of different markets. How do you find or see Arkimoto fitting in that? If you looked at your roadmap and said, step one is this, Step two, and then when we get to maybe autonomy in eight years, step three is this. Well, I, I think there there are pieces that are going to come online much sooner than eight years, and and you know, I, without saying too much, I would say we are actively exploring, and, and I think you'll you'll see from us 
what are essentially um, tests of of new models for uh, for vehicle ownership, for vehicle usage, right. in uh, that will let us, you know, figure out how to scale a you know really build out a scalable fleet of on-demand vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and, and that's uh, that's something that we're you know when I think of Arkimoto, I think of us as really at the confluence of a bunch of different trends in mobility, uh, autonomy, ultra lightweight, right size platforms, electric drive. Um, and when you put all those pieces together, you really yep. get a real transformation effect. Um, so, so what we're doing right now, as you know, as we are focused almost, you know, wholly on getting to scale, yep. part, part of that process is figuring out what are the deployment models that are going to really make sense um, yeah. in the next, you know, five years, essentially. Yeah, and I think that's that's the key, Mar you know, because there's going to be some very uh, crucial marketing points for micro EVs and EVs in general. Tesla was was kind of in a way a little bit lucky in the sense that they were kind of the only game in town. So everybody was referring to them, you know, from press hits and all those kinds of things. They kind of have, you know, they, they didn't really have to advertise because they were, you know, the spotted elephant in the room. Everybody knew who they were and, and, and that kind of thing. So I guess the, uh, when you look at that, it's going to be interesting to watch companies like yours make those steps in going that, uh, in that direction. Is there anything you can share about maybe getting to that? Do you see that happening in the next two years or... Do you feel like this, you really got to get to scale with your new manufa manufacturing plant before you can really kind of open up those lanes? What are your thoughts? Well, well one of the advantages of actually delivering, you know, we are actually delivering product into the market uh, presently. Yeah. So we are we are building, albeit at, at low volume. Um, and those, those vehicles that we are building now, the ones going out to early customers mm -hmm. uh, are, and and the ones that are being put into fleet operations, whether they're rental fleets or yeah. uh, for for a particular business, those are all kind of the pebbles in the pond that uh, that will okay. have that ripple effect in growing the market over the next several years. And yeah. that was something that we definitely saw with Tesla: is that you know Tesla would sell one vehicle into a neighborhood, and then pretty soon yeah. two, three more customers no would come out of the same basic area. As as you know, you see the Joneses getting a cool new ride. Um, and we definitely have experienced, you know, very enthusiastic early customers who are now, you know, they're, we're, we're getting requests for postcards so that they can hand them out to people who ask questions about the vehicle. Uh, and, and that, that, that sort of network effect, um, I think is, it really favors the, the products that we're building. Yeah. Very Just cool. Just cause they, 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 they look different. They look cool. They're super exactly. fun. Um, yeah. and so that's, I, I see that as a real advantage of the Arkimoto platform. Well, and I think also from a business to business uh, side of things, if you were to land into one, you know, restaurant chain that started to move in this direction for delivery, that immediately would start the, do the domino effect. I think then you've got to be able to have, you know, something that's a scalable product and maybe and service that is going to match up because obviously the, the big competitors there are the, the typical last mile, you know, delivery companies, which are still going to be around for a little bit longer uh, you know, our anticipation is we'll probably see those start to fade out in the next two to three years just because of cost uh, and also how long, or there's going to be a, a ton of consolidation uh, to be able to get down to a better price, you know, for these operators. I want to talk to you about the um, kind of the future, the future trends and um, your opinions on where EVs are going, because there's so much material innovation products coming into the marketplace right now. If, I mean, even we, we're covering this like almost night and day. Um, and it's just, it's coming at us at, at a speed I've never seen before in any kind of innovative industry. And I've been in a bunch of them. And if you look at that and, and let's take Tesla as the first one um, with their new battery tech, what is your opinion on what Elon is trying to do with the new battery tech? Obviously, this could play into what you guys are doing I, in the future. I, 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 yeah, I think what Tesla is doing on batteries is fantastic. Uh, you know, if you if you watch, I watched the Battery Day presentation with you know just awe um, at at the, their just the the engineering excellence and the push to get cost and uh, environmental footprint of the battery to where it needs to be. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, you know, really a, an industry leading approach 
that I think will have a, a spillover effect uh, industry wide in the battery battery world. Um, yeah. I, the 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 main argument of Arkimoto is we just need a lot less. You know, mm -hmm. we we have about a quarter of the battery that goes into a full size electric car, which means that you know if, if battery and material is a constraint, and there there really is a, there's you know a, a constraint on on core materials. There's a, yeah. a chip shortage. There's you know we're, yeah. we're, as we enter into these next several years where there's going to be I I think quite a lot of churn as products come into the market either do or don't hit um, their sales targets uh, so, so I think there, there there will be we're entering into kind of what was likely to be a fairly frothy period um, to me that though that really plays to the strengths of Arkimoto which yeah. is that we're uh, you know we can we can solve four times as many trips uh, for customers with the same amount of material as mm -hmm. goes into a full-size electric car um, and, and that as we are looking to, to really solve sustainable transportation, that right sizing of, of the footprint, which is, which is something that I think really sets Arkimoto apart from yeah. just about every other play that, that we've seen in the space, is, is that, that focus on daily utility and right size footprint. Um, th that, I think, has the, the potential to really transform how we look at transportation. Yeah, for sure. With that being the case, how, how big is the kilowatt pack for what you guys are running in the current Arkimoto? Presently 19.2 kilowatt hours. Okay. And that gets you, what, 100 miles of range? Yeah, 102 miles. And so, so we've got probably about 18 kilowatt hours usable in the pack. Um, okay. If you're you know getting up to the 90% charge. Uh, and and that equates out to about 173 miles per gallon equivalent in terms what of efficiency. What is the... What is the uh, the process on the state of charge of how fast you can get to, you know, from 20% to 80% or so? Uh, so it depends on what you're plugged into. You know, the, the, the default model for the Arkimoto is you just plug it into a normal outlet when okay. you get home and every morning you've got a full tank. Uh, okay. It charges in, a, in about just over four hours on a level two charger. And okay. down the road, and, and particularly as we look to more fleet applications, Right. Um, where you have a, a, a vehicle that's in, you know, sort of continuous service, uh, yeah. we're going to want to have faster charging options, both for, for fleet vehicles and then eventually for, you know, touring type applications. But for, for the basic utility thesis, that 100, you know, the, the average American is driving about 30 miles a day or, sure. or was pre-pandemic. I'm imagining that it has it actually Could dropped in the last year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, so a, a hundred mile pack, really solves that daily problem quite quite handily. Yeah. All right, so just so I'm clear, uh, plug in regular, uh, but you said level two, so that's a NEMA, like a 1450 or something like that. It's, that it's, is gonna... it's, the, J, yeah, it's the J1772, 240 okay. uh, volts. So 240, uh, okay, all right. Plug. So a two, basically a, a dryer outlet that's gonna yep. get you full charge in four hours. All right, so in a business to business application, obviously that's not acceptable. We've got to get to supercharging or at least to a level three where we can really kind of accelerate that into maybe under 30 minutes. Do you, is there a, a solution for that right now? Uh, it's, it is on the roadmap. So, okay, so that's faster coming. charging solutions are definitely on the roadmap. And that's, I think, becomes particularly important as we get to volume production. Right, um, right. And, and, and again, you know, whether, whether this, uh, there, there's a lot of low hanging fruit in the mm -hmm. marketplace that doesn't require more than 100 miles of range for a fleet vehicle. And you think about yeah. every, you know, sort of every corporate campus that's got a utility sure. vehicle to go out and do maintenance. You think about uh, even doing last mile delivery in, uh, in, in a relatively dense urban area. What you're concerned with is not maximum range, it's how can I park it, how can I get through traffic, um, and then having a mobile sort of a mobile billboard always helps in terms of driving business. So I, it, you know, my sense is if the, if the utility of the platform today fits your need today, you are a customer today. Uh, and then we're going to strive to, con, you know, expand that circle of uh, applicability um, to more and more uses as, mm -hmm. as we get to higher volume production and certainly as battery technology continues to evolve. 
Yeah. Interesting stuff. I think when when we look at this space, the three wheel we think is probably the the biggest potential target for the B2B side of that. And you mentioned uh, campus and, you know, even if you look at university and all those kinds of things, even with those marketplaces, you're still only, that's a fairly limited uh, market in terms of production. That's probably one year of production for you to cover the entire industry in those markets where we see it is in the 800 to 900,000 units that are out there, you know, in more of that, whether it's the restaurant industry or other other companies that are offering services, floral, delivery, all those kinds of yep. companies that have, and that's probably in the range of anywhere between three and six million locations, which is where we see this huge market for these kinds of vehicles. When you guys are looking at that, obviously you've put your, your roadmap out there. Where do you see Arkimoto in say the next five years? Where do you see you guys well, being well, at that point? Our goal is to, what we're doing right now is is developing our scale production. We're sort of, we're essentially prototyping scale production. Okay. Uh, and once we have that really dialed in, which we think is going to take a couple of years, yeah. Then the the idea is to replicate. It's sort of like we're building the core of the of a microprocessor, and then to add uh, additional capacity, we add cores, and yeah. that's going to mean uh, a, you know remote production locations eventually all over the world where we mm -hmm. think that the Arkimoto platform makes sense. And it, we, we think it makes sense in basically any dense urban area. We think it makes sense in any, you know, as a great suburban urban kind of get around vehicle. Um, I mean, at, at the end of the day, it's, it should cover about 80%. The Arkimoto platform should cover about 80% of the trips on the road or a platform like it. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I see the market potential in, in the long run as being uh, giant, um, yeah, it should, you know, many hundreds of thousands of units yeah. globally every year. Well, and if you look at places like India or China, uh, the three wheel is kind of the, the, the de facto vehicle of choice just because yep. of the dense population. Uh, and that's most likely going to be the, the, the kind of scenario I see here in the U.S., Canada, and even South America to some extent. EV trends that you're watching when, you know, as a CEO of an EV maker, what are you really kind of putting on your bullseye and saying, hey, these guys are doing some very interesting things over here. This company is doing something innovative. What are you guys seeing out there? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I would say it's the the things that I'm really tuned into are um, you know, sort of changes in the business model of delivering transportation. So. Transportation shifting from you know, it, it, there's a there's a, a a saying I think it was Theodore Levitt who said uh, you know people don't want a quarter inch drill they want a quarter inch hole right so that's the the <laughs> right. the, I, the the America's love affair with the car <clears throat> was a marketing campaign uh, from the big automakers uh, yeah. but what as we move into you know much more into the sharing economy uh, into uh, you know, apps on the phone that let you get what you need when you need it. Um, those, that, that it's it's that 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 that's where we start to see the utilization go way up. That's a big yep. piece of sustainability, um, <clears throat> and so that paired with uh, the you know the, the the huge advances in autonomous driving um, sure. are things that we're paying very close attention to, and then you know ultimately we've got to. Uh, have have the right parts that make up the whole, and so mm -hmm. the supply chain and and particularly advances in um, in in battery technology as well as as just general um, simplification of the EV architecture. Those are are all things that are really present for me right now. Yeah, very cool. Well, yeah, that's uh, that in itself because that's the psychology of you know the human mind that's out there thinking about a million different ways to do things and. Uh, I've had several, you know, uh, psych experts that talk about how much wasted time the human species uses on these mundane functions that, you know, we have the capability and the technology is there for us to really kind of change, to be really putting ourselves toward, 
you know, problems that are real problems, you know, versus these ancillary things and just kind of keep us busy, uh, which is a fascinating discussion to go into. Um, Mark, it's been great having you on. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been uh, an amazing one. I love to see what you guys are doing. I'm going to stay uh, watching you very closely as uh, Arkhamoto continues to grow. So good luck in your endeavors out there. We, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you having me on the show. See yeah, you soon. Absolutely. Okay. All right, so you guys are uh, tuning in here over, maybe you're catching this as a podcast over on iTunes or Spotify, or you're catching this on YouTube. Make sure and subscribe. Of course, if you are on YouTube, make sure and hit the bell because you'll get notifications on content right here from uh, Reverend Networks and also the Paul Barron Network. And of course, if you have a CEO or you think we should have an executive and, or an innovator on here on TechPath, make sure and shoot us that idea because that's a big way of how we get connected to our audience. And that's just producer at reverendnetworks.com. You can also hit me up on Twitter, which is just at Paul Barron. And we'll catch you next time right here on TechPath. Thank <laughs> you.